go away. There we go. Okay. Um, can you see my screen, Melissa? Yes. Okay. Um, much to my family's um, consternation, um, I, who'd never been a social media person, uh, started an Instagram account on, um, posted my first poem on the 2nd of January. Um, my feeling at the time was that I felt very sad and I was convinced that writing more poetry and trying to write a poem a week would help me recover. And um, all I can say is it has worked. <laughs> um, the first poem I published um, was actually something I attached to my daughter's Christmas present. I don't know if you can see the full, can you, can you see her with her natural ruby locks? Um, okay, I'm looking for a present for you. I thought of giving you courage, but then I remembered when you were 12, you kept a hockey stick next to your bed for beating intruders. I couldn't give you persistence, not after you got your driving license on your third try in the pouring rain. I was on the verge of choosing truth when I overheard you telling someone rough to back off out of your life. I would have given you charisma if so many hadn't said, I love her, I just love your daughter. As for beauty or wit, the evidence is on the walls and in the length of the applause. So here are six wine glasses instead. Raise one to each of your gifts. Of course, our, um, our year wasn't a normal year of family parties and wine glasses. Um, and we'd all been in various types of hard lockdown and, and January was a particularly hard lockdown. Um, and I felt uh, for, for myself and I mean, some of us weren't even allowed to go out to exercise. We couldn't even walk to the beach, but I also felt for all my friends and family who love traveling. You will go out again. And when you do, a friend's hello will sound like the citation for a prize. And your backpack, no longer sullen on its hook, will fall on your shoulders crying, Udleyu. I think I'm supposed to be doing this as an actual slideshow. And I, um, you're probably seeing all my bits and pieces on the edge. Um, Okay. You should be able to start the slideshow and then we'll see if they Yes, but all the, um, all the Zoom kind of controls are in my way, so I can't get there. Oh, uh, dear. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there another if way of starting click it? on slideshow, I think, at the top. Yeah, but I can't, I can't see it on my screen because uh, there's a Zoom bar there and I don't know how to get that to go away. Yeah. Can you see your bottom bottom buttons? Oh yes. Like where the zoom there. in and out is, because there you should also be able to start the slideshow. Okay. I think the next one, that one, I think. This one. Not that one, the one to the right of it. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Um in um my sister came home and told me about a doctor who'd gone to our local pizzeria after work, after many back-to-back -back shifts in the COVID ward. And um, perhaps the moment of relaxation when she joined her daughters there, she, she burst into tears. The Palmer Road restaurant speaks. For this quiet hour, forget the gurneys and the corridors. Come in, eat pizza with your daughters. Don't cry. Okay, cry, let it out. All day you are a doctor in a mask. Here you can be a woman or a boxer 
hunched in your corner, nearly defeated, but not, because your team draws close. You're good to go another round. And those of you with Catholic childhoods may recognize vocation. Children, said the priest, you must pray for a vocation. The church needs vocations among the young. Dear God, I prayed, I do not want to be a nun. Take one of my sisters instead. Nuns do not write books or poems or make people laugh or live interesting bohemian lives with hardly any money. Oh, you want that kind of vocation, said God and gave it to me. On the um, 14th of January, um, the world marked the statistic of 2 million dead of COVID. We have subsequently passed 4 million dead. And I worry that statistics lose the individual. 2 million dead who had some tick or genius who loved songbirds or waterfalls, who made themselves small for a child, who owned a blanket or sun hat, whose tummy growled at noon, who drank from a favorite cup, who closed their eyes when kissed, who added small sums in their heads, who lay awake thinking, who fell asleep reading, who wanted to say, I'm sorry, goodbye. I love you. And then um, very rapidly, we reached the um, marker of a year of COVID and the effect of lockdown. A year apart, a world apart. 30th of January, 2020. A fine day, no hint of alarm. In a neighboring house, a phone rang, but it wasn't yours, you didn't have to answer. You put the year's travel dates in your diary, ate lunch with a friend in a sunny hotel. Later, you baked a cake from a page sticky with reunion. 30th of January, 2021, a hazy day, no clear road ahead. You eat lunch alone at the kitchen counter. A delivery comes. The masked man backs away. Funeral music interrupts your online meeting. No one is coming to tea. In your house, in your room, a phone is ringing. Listen, it's your call. Answer it. I have to say about the, the music, the funeral music, somebody actually was on a work call with me, a work Zoom meeting, and he was also attending a, a COVID funeral and we actually heard the music. That's quite bizarre. Um, how to write. First, pity yourself. Take an anthropologist's interest in your misery. Stand on the windy hilltop of your woes without bracing. Don't huddle against the cold. Whatever it is, it has the right to pierce you and to change the temperature of your blood. Now, make it funny. I, um, I've been working on... Um, a few, well, two creative writing courses uh, that I'll be offering uh, in from next month. And as I was working on the poetry course, um, I suddenly wanted to write, a, put all my instructions in a poem. <laughs> Think of a poem as a list. Think of glory be to God for dappled things. Think of 
one man in his time plays many parts. Think of, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Think of 10 ways to avoid lending your wheelbarrow to anybody. Think of 13 ways of looking at a blackbird. Think of 11 addresses to the Lord. Think of white space at the edges. Think of ragged strips of words. Think of eggs, milk, salad, love. Think of rolling away the stone. I think, I think it might have been written on Good Friday. It's probably where that came from. Um, adolescence. Only the brave go back there to the whispering, mocking rooms where you may only know what you are not. Not pretty enough, not athletic enough, not tall enough, not dressed right, not like others of your age, a freak. Grieving your stripling girlhood, terrified of the bodica brewing within, you gather your flowering silences, find a space, close the door, and with pen, brush, or thimble, announce, now I will make something beautiful. Love your body, though it wins no prizes. Love your body, though it wins no prizes. No one stands up for you like your long bones, holds a baby or spade as surely as your arms, grants amnesty as wryly as your liver. Bruised and broken, your body barrels headlong at whatever harms you and, despite the cruel things you say to the mirror, wants only road, water, air, and to tell you things. From the skull that cradles your fretful thoughts to the wrinkled wisdom of your elbows, to your toes, the very toes your parents kissed. Try to love your body, though it wins no prizes. So um, on the 18th of April, Jagger Library burned down. Books burning. Gentler than wolves they raised you, books, in whose milky pages you grew tall thoughts and gained the art of living inside others. Your plain, convoluted, loving, and ending reading, recto verso, recto verso, opened door after door until you came here to the deeply treed colonnade of a well-libraried life. And if on a morning when ash was falling and someone was calling, a library is burning, you knew what to feel. It was thanks to the leaves, the leaves. And then in May, um, the next month, my friend and a great champion of poetry, John Maytham, had a heart attack and survived happily. The day you nearly died unfolded in the usual trance. Perhaps the woman scooping leaves stopped at your passing siren. Perhaps the man who once called you idiot pulled over and thought, poor sod. Knowing nothing, we sent no love, no urging, no goodwill, as you sped, nameless towards the edge of the unmapped land, which has no travelogue. That said, you were always the one who broke the news. Reckless. Reckless, I was born a woman to parents who prized art and laughter and had more children than they could safely house. Reckless, I invested in reveries and doodles and men who were polyamorous. 
Reckless, I conceived another poet. Reckless, I carry mint and mercy in my wallet. Reckless, I rise with sun to write and dig for poems in its golden light. It got to be so long um, since we'd all traveled by airplane that I sort of started having flashbacks. What, what, what was it like? Anyway, I was over a glass of wine holding forth to my sisters um, about the, the thought contained in this poem. And they instructed me, having listened to my stream of consciousness, they instructed me to go off and actually write the poem. I remember in the days of flight, when the captain would say, welcome to Cape Town or London. I'd look down from my majestic height at a tiny man below in earmuffs with two ping pong bats who was directing the airplane into its parking bay. And that made me tearful because of the message he seemed to be waving out. How at journey's end, even the mightiest go meekly into their stalls. Even the highest flyers kowtow to the final semaphore. It's true that sometimes I'd had a glass of wine en route. On his 104th birthday for Bad Paddy Dowling, born the 8th of June, 1917. With delicate fine brushes in the tomb, excavate your father. To begin, Dust off his drunken rages and display in a delighted museum his cry of quiet to the rain. Duck into a chamber where babies are held high. Here again the parable, the parable of four roses and a butterfly. Don't be afraid to step across the threshold of the time before you were born. There was love there too, yes, lust for a woman who did not startle at loud noises or fumble at wired objects that reminded her of mines. Quiet, shh, tiptoe, fairies cling to the sill of this last room where songs of spellbound swans rang truer than a father dead in France. Now leave the bones to sleep and in fields of clover, on strands of sea kale, see the boy run. My father was, um, as you can tell from our names, um, of Irish extraction and um, had extremely romantic ideas about Ireland and told us that um, he was going to take us to meet the Queen of the Fairies in Ireland. And um, we had to give news items at school um, in sub -A. And I put up my hand and the others all said, you know, I've got a new baby brother, we've got a new post box. I put up my hand and said, my father is taking us to Ireland to meet the queen of the fairies. And the teacher put the lid back on her pen and that was it, you know, it wasn't, she said, this page is for news. So there you are. Love then, love now. At 21, he spent eight minutes working out how to scale a wall to her bedroom window. At 75, he spends two days working out how to WhatsApp her a pulsating heart. Plumbersville. When I hear them finish up, I come downstairs, irritated at the thought of what it will cost. Inside the tiny loo, Omar is holding Solzhenitsyn's words. Have you read this? He asks. I want to reply, why do you think it's framed? But he reads it to me anyway. His chalky, careworn finger underlines the good bits. How? 
If you're not hungry, cold, or injured, why envy? And now this part, he says, is the most important of all. Never part from anyone in anger. It may be your last act. I feel him examining me as if I were a broken handle, as if he needed to test my ability to plumb. Then he writes out the bill, carefully including the minutes spent on Russian literature. When I cannot sleep, I furnish heaven with the usual staples, whiskey, water, books, caffeine, pillows, a beach at dawn. Then just as my brain begins to spindle, I remember who made life alive and I add you and you and you. Last week, it felt like the country was burning. Um, and although there have been times in since uh, making my vow to write a poem a week, there were times when there was one time when I published a pre existing poem, times the Plummersville was a poem that I had written before, but it had, for one thing, it had too many plumbers in it. Um, so I, I, I worked on that. But really this Sunday, I couldn't think of a poem to write. Um, and so I, I sat in bed on Sunday morning and I said to the, the absent poem, the not written poem, I said, you can use anything in this brain of mine. You can, you, you can anything that is of use to you. And, and the poem then wrote itself this way. Still lovely beyond all singing. After fire and plunder, another sound. Bristles raking broken ground. Amidst the trash and waste and weeping, the age old fortitude of people sweeping. Thank you very much. Um, I think we just got in before, and I'd like to just say that, um, Melissa, if I may, that um, I will be offering some creative writing courses from next month. And um, so if anyone wants to be on my mailing list, um, there is uh, my email address. Um, just write and ask me to put you on it thank you i'm going to stop sharing thank you i'm going to pop that in the chat as well people didn't write it down in time thank you for sharing that was wonderful i love your ability to bring lightheartedness into into the topics you write on and if you're open to a few questions until you possibly yeah. get that all sure. Um, yeah, I'd love to know, is that something that's always been part of your writing, this humor? Um, is that something that comes naturally to you or do you aim to bring it in? You've got the one poem that ends on then make it funny. Is that something <laughs> you try to do? Well, I think people uh, start to develop an expectation of you. Um, I, I grew up in a family where um, humor was uh, very deeply valued and practiced um, and on all kinds, every possible form of humor. Um, so um, you had to be um, funny or dramatic um, uh, in order to get noticed in a family of eight. Um, I love irony. Um, I love wordplay. I find, and I do find when I, even when I'm uh, considering something quite sad or dark, quite often um, it's like a, a plunging action where um, this force pushes you back up again. Um, this force that comes from nowhere finds humor or hope or something like that. So, yeah, I think it's built in. Awesome, thank you. That's wonderful. Um, does anyone have any questions that you'd like to 
Raise your hand, pop in the chat, unmute yourself, any of those. Margaret, I see a hand. Yes. Yes, I want to know that last poem, was that published on Instagram? Because somebody sent it to me. I was so, I just loved it. <laughs> and uh, somebody sent it to me and I said, oh, no, but I've never heard that one. You know, and I thought I had, I knew a lot of your poems, but those are all new. Were well, they all Instagram yeah. ones? Yes, yeah, so so Margaret, since since um, the second of January, I've I've been I've been disciplining myself to publish a poem a week on Instagram. So it's completely new. So you wouldn't have um, you might have seen one of these before, but um, uh, yes. And then what happened with the last poem was that people uh, moved it across to WhatsApp groups and to Facebook and. Yes. Um, it's then a, it sort of it gone, traveled the world. Gone viral, has it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to use that. <laughs> it gone that me metaphor's got to be banned. <laughs> got to be banned. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. <clears throat> I, I don't remember that's banned. <laughs> okay. Anyone else got anything you'd like to ask or comment? Douglas, hi. Hi. I'm sure you're a fan of Wendy Cope. Yes, yes, I am. She seems to have a singular facility for gently prodding at whatever whatever subject she's she's looking at or whatever situation she's looking at. And, and the humor is wonderfully lighthearted and but always has this under underpinning of seriousness. Yeah. Um, I, I do worry sometimes um, that poets like um, me or Wendy Cope um, and certainly Gus Ferguson, um, people don't know how to classify us um, and there's some discomfort about um, about humor should humor you know as Woody Allen said you know you must sit at the children's table um, so I mean I do personally think that humor is the greatest exercise of one's intellect um, and I think it is an emotion no less than any of the other ones um, you know it's as worthy as love or praise or um, any other form. Um, so, yeah, I, but I do think one treads a balance, a, a, a tightrope, because how, um, well, like Ferlinghetti said, you know, constantly risking absurdity. It's, um, poems can fall, the tone of a poem can fall wrong. I am aware of that, yeah. Uh, so I do think it is a, it's a fairly dangerous thing to do to introduce humor into something essentially sad. And yet, and yet, to anyone who would dismiss humor in poetry, one could surely hold up the face of Shakespeare and say, "Was this not the preeminent humorous poet, the greatest yeah. practitioner in the English language?" So I think I think. It's a, it's a, it's a, to denigrate humorous poetry in any way is a false judgment. It is very important. Mm. So you're very important, and so was Gus, and so is Wendy Cope, and anyone else who writes funny poems. Yeah, and I think those Renaissance um, poets and Shakespeare and the metaphysical poets. Um, th if you study them, you get to understand the word wit you know, um, in its true sense. Yes. Which, which is not just ha ha, you know, it's, it's just so, so much more. Indeed. Thank you. Hi, Janice, yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, yes, I just, as, as I'm dialing in as it were from the UK, and first of all, I have to say that the last poem you read has gone around here, of course, uh, among all of those who have been just devastated to hear what's happened in South Africa and felt helpless and um, obviously uh, 
worry, etc. But that poem just encapsulates so much of what is amazing about the country. If someone who's been back and forth over the years and written books about it, etc. But I just really want to do a little bit of a fangirling thing. I love your poetry. And my sister-in-law, who is here somewhere, um, was the first person to send me a book of your poems in 2002. Uh, your very first book and I've uh, just uh, loved your poetry ever since and I absolutely agree with the last speaker about you know comic poetry which is is so it's so difficult to write well and so difficult and so powerful because it is it's not like somebody in my poetry society when we were good um, I think we had Sophie Hannah come um, but I mentioned Wendy Cope and he said well I don't know about light burst and I kind of wanted to slap him because really it's not light verse. It's incredibly difficult to write. And it's so, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's got a kick and it really gets to you. So thank you so much because I've, I've really loved uh, reading your poems over the years. And yeah, so stop fangirling now and I'll let someone else talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Yeah. Um, I do love the way the world is so connected now that, you know, a poem you wrote on Sunday morning, you know, in Musenberg, South Africa, can be right across the world an hour later. Uh, and, and you can join us this evening. So there are some <laughs> classes, yeah. Um, fabulous, I see Jacques' hand is up. Hi, Thanula, I, I came late, but it is it's just wonderful to hear your voice. Thank you, Jacques. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I missed you. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> um, yes, no, I, I am. And I, I don't know whether this is a question or whether it's more like witnessing, but I, I've, I wonder if you, if you could say something about the power of poetry to, to lift, to lift people up and make them want to live. It's not something that I would have said a few years ago, you know, poetry ought to do necessarily, but each time I, I come to your poetry, I find it has this quality that when I'm in a, when I'm in a really dark place, uh, it fetches me there. And it sort of, it, it sort of, and it, it has an uplifting quality to it. It, it, but it acknowledges, it acknowledges very difficult uh, emotions. I don't, I don't, my experience of it isn't, isn't of lightness, it's of range and, and, but an upward movement. Um, so I'm, I'm just really glad that it's in the world. And I don't know if you want to say something about that, about that. that yeah, I do, um, I, I agree that the, um, we do we all turn to poetry um in times of distress and i saw the editor of the daily maverick saying yesterday or the day before that the news that he has to deal with on a daily basis now in south africa is so bad that all he really wants to do is read and write poetry um it's so interesting that it's a genre that's considered antithetical to the news it, it it sort of fits itself into the news. I mean, I, I'm often drawn to news events and, and many poets are, but I, I agree with you that there is this um, aspect of consolation. And, and, I, and I, I can understand why that could be a danger because one doesn't want to cheerlead people in times of utter catastrophe necessarily. You know, there is also um, the value um, of, looking something straight in the eye um yes. how awful it is and and acknowledging being strong enough to do that but what i think um what i feel about writing this kind of poetry that deals with um world pain and local pain is um that it a poem provides a kind of architecture so the poem acknowledges here above me above you is this crushing weight but the poem is holding it up it's got these steel girders it, it's um, just like a brilliantly made bridge. Um, and, and so you are in the pain, but you are also uplifted from the pain. I think 
you know, poets are, are emotional engineers. Yes. Um, you know, when we're doing it right, that is. Um, so yes, I from I also myself when I first started writing poetry, I started off in the ordinary way, you know, with a broken heart, and I think I wrote four or five "My Heart Is Broken" poems, and um, and then the others came. But it what I did turn to poetry as a way of as relief, um, mm. because writing it down, putting something into words putting extreme um, stretched, you know, nerves that have been stretched taut, um, putting that into, into a poem is already a, a form of healing. Or maybe, maybe that is, is that a cliche? Is that kitsch? I don't know, but it feels no, that way. No, I think you're right. And I think it's, it's also that, I think that, I think that the, the poems that you, that you're writing are they give they give permission for broken things to stay broken in a way i i but somehow by giving it form it 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 lifts something yeah and i also i think i mean i don't know if we should talk about you know what is the poet's job but i do think poets should think of themselves as conduits um as channels um, and and let let the pain move through them in some way. <clears throat> I mean, artists do that. And you take take the pain on yourself and and if you can transform it into something beautiful or bearable, something that makes carrying on a little bit easier. Mm. I think poetry does that also by uh, reaching beyond the um, the mere newspaper article, which has a particular bearing in the here, here and now. It has a date and a place, and poetry's got that ability to have one foot there in the here and now, and then lift things to some kind of universal level. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm. I'm just, I'm just so glad that your poems are in the world. And the other day, one of them made me, um, you know, pick up the phone and, and, and reach out to, 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 to people when I, when I needed to. And that's, it's a, it's a, it's a great thing. Thank you. Thank you, Shark. Anyone else would like to say something? Ruth, I see your hand. Oh yeah, I just wanted to say, um, yeah, Fanula, I um, before Jacques spoke, I was just thinking about with, and it it kind of relates to what um what Jacques was saying about healing, and that you, I, I think you have this amazing ability with to use humor in a way that doesn't dismiss depth of feeling or um or erase emotion um but but it carries a whole sort of a, a, a whole weight of feeling behind it um and and i i was um yeah i just also really loved your your um notes from the dementia award collection that you wrote um, and then the way in which you used with their, um, and I was, I, I guess I'm wondering if you could say maybe what, what do you find most valuable about humor and um, how it can be employed in the strongest or most meaningful way possible in poetry? And um, I don't know if that's really making sense. <laughs> Thank question. Um, well, I mean, I think you're you on your way to it. I think I think poetry, um, a humor in poetry, um, is just this. Um, it can play with things, so it can say this thing is awful, but it's also funny. Um, well, the notes from the dementia ward will be an example 
where I was struggling on a daily basis um, with my mother's dementia, but also recognizing the irony that there were times I, we were all laughing at the remarks she made. Um, and at, so, yeah, I think humor changes things. It changes you physiologically. Um, Henri Bergson, one of the few philosophers who's written about humor, talks about how when you laugh, something breaks up inside you. you your chest performs a breaking action. And that humor breaks things that, are, that seem solid, um, that seemed sort of intransigent, that's, that seemed like you couldn't touch them. And the, so you, your physiology changes when you when you laugh, when you find humor and your brain is doing something because humor requires you to have access to double meanings, to, to be here and somewhere else at the same time. So I think that ambiguity that humor uses, the way it, it sometimes refuses reality by exaggerating um, all, all the techniques of humor, the rhetoric of humor, um, I mean, there's this huge range of, of things that you can do as, um, as a poet using humor. It's not just one thing. Um, they all allow you to uh, reject reality and create a new one. Um, and also for a time um, to find fellow feeling with others. I mean, you will you notice how I'm sure even in the dark times we've had in the last two years, there've been times when you have found yourself laughing with friends or family while describing the lockdown regulations or, or worse. Um, we do, there is a dark humor thing that mm -hmm. as, if, as if by laughing, we're saying, look, in the grand scheme of things, we're all going to die. So why not even laugh at death? Thank you for that. That was interesting as well. Is there anyone else who'd like to say anything? You're welcome to unmute yourself. No, yes. Doesn't look like it. Hi. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm brand new. This is my first time on your on your blog. I don't know what you would call it. It's really been tremendous, and the poetry's been really uplifting. But um, I, I've been I've been concerned that firstly is that people seem to need to defend humor in a poem. I don't think it's something that needs to be defended or explained. It's like anything else. And I actually just wrote down something that I was going to send you in the chat. So just bear with me. And if you don't want me back, just tell me. <laughs> um, I said, laughing or crying is a sound made by the paper when you unwrap the truth. And that's all it is. It's just the wrapping. The truth is inside that. And like you tur turf away the wrapping, you're left with the truth. Whatever, however you get there, in my view, it's the wrapping. And it's essential because then it becomes a gift if it's wrapped. But if it's, if it's humor or uh, horror or humor or happiness or sadness, it's a wrapping. And that's what I had to say. Sorry if I'm just stuck. Bully my way in on my first appearance, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a way in, absolutely. Um, it's an angle. Um, Which my bullying or the rapping? Um, whatever you, whatever you, whether you choose to be serious or you choose to be humorous, as you say, you're getting inside to the truth. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and what I think is important about the rapping, and I wouldn't use that metaphor, is I think the way in which you get to the truth has to be true to you. So, you know, not, not to try and copy the style of whoever you think is, is the, the leading poet of the day, just um, to, to find your voice and reconcile yourself to that voice. 
Yeah, well, once you've accepted that it's a gift, then you've accepted the truth and all around it is, I don't know, it's like a view of a city at night. It's just lights, but it, uh, in the day when, when it's unwrapped, you see the city, it's what's there. I don't know. I just think that the honesty of the truth that you unwrap is decided by you, not by the wrapping. Sure. And I loved your poetry. I really fantastic. Thanks, Raymond. Yeah. No, come back. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Raymond. You are welcome to jump on any time and please do join us again. Anyone no. else would like to say anything? Oh, Richard. Um, I've got a question. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hi, Finarela. Um, I'm just curious to hear your take on nature poetry. I don't know if that's something that you write much of, but how does nature feature in your poetry? Do you feel that you relate to it as a, an entity consciously? No, I'm, I'm not a nature poet. Um, South Africa has an extraordinary tradition of nature poets. And, you know, I, I see Peter Anderson is, is going to publish a new collection through Dryad and, and he would be an example of one of our foremost practitioners. I mean, Stephen Watson was another admirable nature poet. So I, I leave it to them. I, I would say, um, I mean, if I have to be absolutely honest, I, um, I found that we had too much nature poetry at school. Um, maybe the, the syllabus at that time was a bit influenced by the romantic poets. Um, I wanted human beings and I wanted them speaking. Um, I, I think maybe because my mother was an actress and drama teacher, I like the idea of people being alive and speaking mm. in poems. And so you'll find more of that, but I do admire and I, especially now in my old age, as I'm, I read a little bit more slowly and meditatively, um, I do recognize the beauty of, you know, Wendell Berry and the kinds mm. of poets who, um, particularly who use nature to access some kind of deep peace or calm, I, that I really do love. I think Mary Oliver does it too, yeah. Yeah, several but just a just a poem that says you know here is a little booky um or here is a rock with some like and i i don't you know why i think okay thanks thank you for that sarah um richard i saw you had wanted to ask something yes i, I just wanted to say Sorry about that. Um, I just want to say how nice it was the way the presentation was given with the words in front of you, with, with little illustrations as well. It's like hearing it twice to be able to see the words and have it read to you at the same time. Uh, it made it, uh, made it particularly special. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you like that. Um, I, it's something I would like when I hear other people. Um, I, I also, like you, I, um, I hear with my eyes as well. So it, it really helps to see. It's, it's very difficult to take, take something in, particularly a poem, to take it in, in one reading. Even, if, even when it's particularly well read, it's difficult to take it in. Whereas if you've got the words there as well, it makes it a little easier. Yeah. So thank you very much for your Thanks. Effort. Yeah. Well, maybe it can become a feature. Maybe your, your reading can do that. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for that feedback, Richard. Something for us to, to think of as well going forward. Um, anyone else would like to say anything? Seems that your load shedding hasn't hit so far, which is great. Yeah, I see, uh, is that Silka? Silka, hi. Uh, 
she said no, she, she also not. she found seeing the words simultaneously um is very helpful and she enjoyed the doodles and the dates <laughs> Yeah, so then I think um, we can have a, a short break before our open mic section. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you for your reading. It was fantastic, and I think you are doing wonderful, Thanks. wonderful work in, in your field, and we all enjoyed it, and we've got a great turnout. So for those of you who haven't joined us before, please do join us again. Um, the info is in the chat to join our mailing list. We also have a poetry competition on this month. Um, so submissions close on the 31st of July. We want one poem per poet living in South Africa. Um, and all that info is on our Facebook as well. So please send us your work. We want to read it and stay and share in the open mic. We'll take a five minute break. So we'll be back at about 28 past eight, according to my clock.